You're about to watch a videotape of instruction training being provided by Dyke and Applied Americas on May 5th, 2017. The video is intended for the sole purpose of supporting Dyke and Applied's published procedures and is not intended to replace Dyke and Learning Institute's owner operator training. Equipment startup procedures, service processes, etc. change over time. Dyke and Applied does not warrant the timeliness of the information contained in this videotape, and Dyke and Applied assumes no obligation to update the information presented in this training session. In addition, the information presented at this training session is not intended to be an all-inclusive with respect to product, maintenance, or service issues. If you need advice about a particular maintenance process, product, or service issue, you should consult with a Dyke and Applied professional. The applicable data sheets, product manuals, and instructions for the specific Dyke and Applied products being serviced or maintained should be consulted for information about that product, including, without limitation, information regarding safety, maintenance, operation, design, installation, care, warnings related to, and proper uses of each Dyke and Applied product. In addition, the training is typically better when it can be done in person. That gives the person being trained the opportunity to ask questions and seek clarification of any confusing issues. Dyke and Applied specifically disclaims all liability for errors or omissions in or the misuse or misinterpretation of any information presented in this training session. The videotape is intended for direct employees of the owner, may not be reproduced or shared with any third party without Dyke and Applied's prior written consent. If you have any questions, please hold them until the end of the training session and I will answer them after the videotaping has concluded. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Henry Dunkel with Dykin Applied Service. We're here today to cover some of the components of a Dykin magnetic bearing chiller. We'll cover the components, how they interact with each other through the operation of the chiller, and if possible, we'll maybe even run the chiller today, I'm not sure. What we've got here is the magnetic bearing chiller. We have two compressors on this chiller. They are Danfoss TurboCore compressors. No oil, all magnetic bearings in those compressors. That compressor up there is a two-stage centrifugal compressor. There's two impellers in the front end with inlet guide vanes on the front of the compressor. On top of the compressor is where the variable frequency drive is located. It's all enclosed in that uh, upper housing. On the side of the compressor, we have the DC link capacitors. You can see the long, narrow tubes on the side that are enclosed also. On the back side, when we walk around back, we'll take a look back in there is a back plane which takes all the values from the uh, components, deciphers what it has to do and tells the compressor uh, what speed it has to rotate. Besides the compressors, we come down from the compressor on the discharge line of the refrigerant circuit. The discharge line goes down into the condenser. Located right here is a discharge check valve. The upper vessel is the evaporator. That's where the liquid refrigerant is going to be coming in, boiling off. Water's coming through your tubes, being cooled, and going out to your system. On the back side, we have electronic expansion valve that controls that flow of liquid refrigerant, all done through the processor on how to control that valve, is what we have. Front of the chiller, we have the main power panel here. The power panel inside the enclosure, uh, should we open this up, we basically have two line reactors, one for each compressor. Line reactors reduce any low level harmonics uh, the compressor may generate, is what we have here. Also inside here we have the control circuit transformers. From this panel we have what we call a power cable that supplies the control box over here with the voltages for the controller, the PC, and the touch screen is what we have. Uh, I think we'll go in the back, look at the expansion valve. Uh, I also want to show you the electronic flow switches that we use now versus paddle type. We're using a thermal dispersion flow sensor. So we'll move to the back and I'll show you where those are at. On the back side of the chiller, again, we have both compressors on top of the evaporator. Underneath this cover is a black plain board that controls a lot of the functions for the compressor itself. Your electrical power for the compressor comes in through this conduit right here on each compressor. We have a 5 ace refrigerant cooling line that comes up to each compressor. That's, cooling is controlled by the compressor for the electronics on the top of the compressor. That's what this line is for here. You're seeing three copper lines here. Those are basically piped to the uh, refrigerant relief valves on each vessel, so should our pressure exceed 200 pounds, that relief valve would re relieve and uh, be piped outside. Down below here is the electronic expansion valve. 
This valve is what's controlling the liquid refrigerant to supply the evaporator to the proper level for the, for the cooling of the water going through the evaporator. On each side of the electronic expansion valve, we have what we call a load balance valve. That load balance valve basically is, in, is energized and opens when either compressor starts. Eat one valve per compressor. What we're doing with the opening of the load balance valve is reducing the lift on the impellers so the compressor starts easier. So load balance valve is open on startup, is closed during normal operation. Down below on the uh, water cool condenser, there's a sight glass down here. At different times in operation, you're going to see a level in that sight glass, a liquid refrigerant, which is going to vary depending on the load of the machine. Uh, there's a sensor here, liquid line temperature sensor. We use that for calculating subcooling, is what we have there. Relief valves and compressor. There are another couple smaller relief valves from each suction line, each compressor again piped outside. Should for some reason we shut the suction service valve, pressure builds up in the compressor for any reason, that at high pressure we relieve outside. That's what we have there. Uh, I'll point out the uh, electronic flow sensor on the other chiller, it's easier to see. I'll kind of explain the operation of that as well we'll do. What we provide on the uh, WMC chillers is a factory mounted thermal dispersion flow sensor. This flow sensor is uh, heat activated basically is what it is. With no flow we have a temperature that builds up and the switch is in the open position. As your water velocity increases through the pipe it removes the heat from the dispersion sensor which then closes its contact to sense flow. Presently right now you can see there's just a uh, green LED flashing with a red LED in the center. As your flow or your velocity increases in the pipe indicating we have flow, the, the green LEDs will move up to the red that, that once we establish flow that we want to see, that red LED will turn amber. Then it'll go beyond that amber LED to green, which indicates we have more than enough flow. Typically what you're going to see on these, when you have good flow, the green LEDs will be a solid bar all the way across with the amber in the middle. So, a good way to troubleshoot that is to watch those LEDs, see if they're fluctuating or if they're steady. Indication of error or problem with flow in your system. So instead of paddle type, we're using flow dispersion sensors is what we're using. There's one of these sensors on each entering line to the condenser and to the uh, evaporator. Alright, we're back at the power panel on the front of the machine. As you can see, it has a door mounted disconnect. Inside the power panel, we have a line reactor, one for each compressor. In the center of the panel, there's a control circuit transformer that steps down the voltage from line 480 down to 115. Up in the upper left corner here, we have two transformers that step down from 115 to 24 volts for our controls in the control panel. We have a three second time delay mounted up in the upper left corner. The, the intent of that is to delay voltage restoring back to the control panel should we have a voltage fluctuation. Instead of a quick resetting of the power, we're delaying that from energizing within three seconds while we're doing The thermostat here is controlling the upper cooling fan. That thermostat is set for 90 degrees. Once temperature comes up in the cabinet, that fan will energize. Each compressor has its own individual breaker. So if you want to isolate one compressor due to uh, some unknown reason, you can actually isolate that and lock it out on each, uh, each breaker here. Center door disconnect right in the center, line voltage coming in. Moving over from the power panel, we have our OITS. We call it OITS, it's an abbreviation for Operator Interface Touchscreen. It's an LCD panel, 15 inch, which we're pulling data from the controller in the control panel, bringing it through a PC to the OITS, which is your interface for our setting set points, reading uh, temperatures, pressures, and all the above. There. Moving over to the control panel, one thing I want to make particular note of, is the tag on the panel door. Uh, we get calls all the time with models and serial numbers. Somebody took the model tag off the back of the condenser or the evaporator. This tag has the information that we will need to look up your machine referencing any parts or any data that we need. We have a model number WMC 250D. STNU and the serial number means it was built in Stanton, Virginia. And we have another smaller number here on the left side. That is actually a sales order number that we can go back and look at the machine also. So anytime you call in for anything regarding this chiller, please get the numbers off this panel, this uh, front uh, tag. Is what we got. What we'll need.
Inside the control panel, we've got the unit controller. Uh, that controller also is where we store our set points. This machine does not need the operator interface touchscreen to work. It does not need the PC and the OITs. We can operate solely off that controller. So if you have a problem with, a, with, a, with an OITs, we can still operate this machine. What it basically is doing is we are taking the signal and the data from the unit controller through a universal control module into the PC, which then brings it up to the operator interface touchscreen so we can read our values. In the upper left corner here, this is actually the expansion valve board. That board takes a signal from the unit controller and says, sends the, uh, the data out to, or the signal out to, the electronic expansion valve on the back to determine where that valve should be positioned. Inside the panel on the upper left, there are three switches. One's a unit switch, which will shut down the whole chiller. Below that is, is a switch labeled compressor one, below that is compressor two. As you face this chiller, compressor one is the one on the left, compressor number two is the one on the right. You can shut off either compressor by those switches. Should you shut off the upper unit switch, you shut down the whole machine. There's also another switch on the right side of this panel which will shut down the whole machine also. Down below in this panel, we have our interface cards which go up to each compressor. Through that interface card, we are reading the data out of the compressor software, bringing it into our unit controller, which then in turn brings that data up here to the lights through the PC. There are green lights on those I.O. cards. The green lights should always be on. You'll see a series of uh, red lights that'll flash upon energizing the load balance valves. This will happen there. What we have here is the operator face touchscreen. This screen is the first screen that you will see upon reapplying power to the chiller after the PC boots up and all our data comes over the machine. Very basic, very basic. We're seeing in and out of our water temps on the evaporator, in and out on the condenser, and your active leaving water set point. Up in the upper left hand corner, shows us the actual condition the machine is in. Right now, cooling is off from remote switch. That remote switch stands for a relay contact when they say switch. So right now, we're not telling the chiller to run. You can see each compressor status, number one is off and number two is off in unit state. To scroll through the, the uh, OITs, we hit the second view screen and now we're starting to bring in more data. More data regarding suction temps, discharge temps, RPMs, minimum and maximum RPMs, and actual RPM. Again, entering and leaving water temps on an evaporator condenser. And this is where our pressures come in for the evaporator and condenser. We show our actual electronic expansion valve position and our liquid line temperature. Through the bottom here, you're going to see a series of little square buttons. You see right now I'm reading compressor number one. To scroll to compressor two, we touch the compressor button. We go to number two and read its values. That's what we're doing. Uh, the unit IOs, what we're looking at is the actual conditions of four IOs on this, this unit. Manual switch is one of the switches in the control panel. Here's your evaporator water flow and condenser water flow, which is actually the thermal dispersion flow sensors I had shown you earlier. When they're closed, those will be green. The digital output here is the interlock. That interlock is the, is the relay contact that goes down the I.O. card that says compressor start. So you'll see that interlock key turn green when we're telling that compressor to run. When these compressors are operating, as you see them, you'll see a green box on each compressor, whichever one's operating, is what you will see. We have a power tab here, basically showing our current voltage and the KW that we're using presently on each compressor. Again, you scroll back and forth between the two compressors is what we'll be doing to see exactly what the amperage is of that compressor. Uh, unit I.O. Unit I.O. is again, uh, we have different start contacts, manual switch, again control panel, remote start is actually this relay contact here I kind of talked about. Mode switch you will not be using on this chiller. These digital outputs, your building automation system is controlling all those outputs regarding uh, evap and condenser pump, tower fan, and all that. So the material is not doing any control on that. We do have an alarm light. I'll show you an alarm uh, later on here and, and what happens when we get an alarm. We have some analog outputs here that we're not using on this application. 
We can, once we get to the center of the machine, touch the evaporator conditions where we have our entering and leaving conditions here, the delta temp across it. Your evap flow GPM is always going to be at zero. Right now, the, there was not a field supplied transducer to give you a true GPM. So that value is going to be zero. We have our refrigerant pressures and temperatures, which in turn calculate our uh, suction super heat for us. The condenser key is again, condenser entering and leaving water temperatures and the temperature difference between those. Flow rate again is going to be at zero. Heat recovery, we're not using that on this chiller. It's not a heat recovery machine. We'll have our pressures and temperatures saturated and we'll calculate a discharge super heat as well as subcooling on this machine is what we'll do. We have a menu key down here and you can actually change the look of your whole oit. You can go into label bar graphs where you're looking at a series of bar graphs. It gets a little busy with the colors. I've seen jobs where they like to use this for their operator log. Typically, we're going to see chiller schematic, where again, we're back to a, an easier to read uh, uh, picture here on, on our values is what we're doing. The history key actually is graphing what the chiller is doing. This is all graphing, storing in the PC. We can remove that data using a thumb drive in the end of the PC, pull that data out by selecting the day we want and copy to USB is what we can do. So we copy to USB, we'll have that data in an Excel CSV file. You can look at all these conditions on the same, same sheet is what you can do. Here we've recorded all the uh, alarms that are in the machine. A lot of these here I caused when, uh, during a startup and some of these unused were earlier on when they built the machine at the factory. We can take and uh, bring all these alarms to, a, again, a flash drive or a stick, touching the alarm key, copy to USB, and that'll, that'll list every alarm that we have in the machine from the time it's been started. The history files, we can go back um, 30 days on the history files is what we can do. One thing you can do also, when you see an alarm, you can actually touch that alarm and you'll get a small indication uh, values of what the machine was doing when that alarm occurred. So if you don't want to download a USB, you need a simple thing. Let's say you had maybe a water flow loss or a high pressure. You can actually click that line. It'll bring your data in, show you're entering and leaving water temps, uh, valve position, and actually what we're running on the uh, compressor at the time of the fault. So we can kind of do a little quick uh, diagnosis off of that. That's what you can do. Uh, we're only going to show, what is it, eight? Eight faults on the screen, but yet again, when you download it to, U to the USB, you'll show all of it, is what you will do. 30 days on the history file is what we'll have. So we'll have 30 days of uh, graphing is what we do. Uh, that's a 10 second, 10 second snapshot on those, so it's, it's checking, checking it fairly fast is what it's doing. We get into the set screen, and that's where we, we've got our, our set points in the machine. If we would touch the water key, we're showing all our water set points. Presently, right now, the chiller is set for 44 degrees. That's what we've got. Should you want to make a change to that value, a low-level password in this. If you would hit change, low-level password is 100. And enter. At that point, I highlight the 44. I go to change. I can go up and down with that value or I can actually put a value in there and enter it, is what I can do. So once you enter that, your password's gonna be all valid for 10 minutes with no touching on the touch screen. It'll erase itself when the screen goes into sleep mode. One thing you have to remember is don't click on the actual value. Always go to the right of that value to the highlights in blue. When you highlight that in blue, you're gonna get a window here that actually tells you what that value is and what the setting is doing. So if you have a question on what this value is, you can just click it. There it tells you what it is. One thing about the OITs, uh, if you're going through the OITs and changing or want to look at anything, as long as you don't have a password in, you're not going to affect anything. You're not going to make any changes. You can go in there, look, check your values without password. You don't have to worry about making a mistake or anything. Water set points were pretty self-explanatory, 44 degree leaving. Um, I'll put that back to 44. We are doing, on this machine, a 4 to 20 milliamp reset. 
So at 4 milliamps, you're gonna have 44 degrees. At 20 milliamps, we're gonna go 10 degrees above our 44 to 54. So the four to 20 signal is coming from your building automation, and that will raise and lower your set point. Oh yeah. Our shutdown delta is three degrees below the 44, so once we're running fully unloaded, the temperature continues to drop. You'll cycle off at 31. Presently, we have it set to come back on at 49 degrees. Stage delta. That stage delta is what brings on the second compressor. When the machine first starts, it's gonna bring the first compressor on. The way it's set right now, is the compressor with the least amount of starts will start first, the one with the most hours will stop first. So the least starts will start first, ramp up, open its veins, is what it'll do. You're gonna see an inlet guide vein position here. Once that lead compressor gets to 110% inlet guide vein, is 95% of maximum RPM, and we're two degrees above our uh, Leading water set point, that's what will initiate the lag start, as well as start the second compressor. So that all kind of ties into that. Your modes were set up, different things here. Switches is a control source, which means we have a relay contact, which is located right here, is enable relay. Uh, we have a relay right here on the side. There'll be a red LED when that enables. That's why that control source is set to switches. Uh, we are communicating through BACnet MSTP on this machine. There's, if they ever wanted to, you could go to building automation, BAS and that, and everything can go done through the BACnet is what it can do. Uh, my compressor stage sequence here, that's where it's set up for the starts and hours for the lead leg of the compressors in that position. We have a max compressors on where I can set how many compressors maximum do I want. If I change that to one, we'll only ever run one compressor. Should it fault, the other one would come on, and the compressor with the least hours would start and be the lead compressor, is what it would do. Um, presently, right now, for your job, I'd say number two is where you're gonna wanna keep that, because um, I, I don't use that very often, except for a grossly oversized chiller, is where I'll see that. Motor key. We're setting our amp draws. Everything is set through a nameplate amp, what the compressor should draw. Our maximum and minimum amps is a percentage. We'll let the compressor go to 100%, which is 86 amps, and we'll go down to 3%. When these compressors start, you're gonna see the shaft levitate. Once that shaft starts a key, you're not gonna see any amps at all. Finally, you'll see four amps, five amps. There's no real inrush on these compressors, so we've gotta set that minimum amp low enough that it doesn't think I have no amps, and we get an alarm is what would happen on that. Uh, maximum minimum leaving water temps, leaving water rates, that is. We're, we're gonna, our max is a half a degree a minute for pull down. If it starts exceeding that, it's not gonna load anymore, but we have to do at least two tenths of a degree on pull down. What that is, that's, that slows the compressor from overshooting. Uh, speeding up too fast, opening too many veins, and overshooting our water temp and having to back up. So it's kind of an energy saving feature there is what that is. Uh, the alarm key, and the alarm key that's all values that I set with a higher level password or, or technician set. This is our safety set points to protect the compressors and the chiller. Uh, timers, we're looking at evap research time, half a minute, 30 seconds when we first tell it to call. We're not controlling pumps, but we're waiting 30 seconds before we actually initiate a uh, start sequence. Stop to start timers. Start to start timer means you've got to run five minutes for the timer to expire. If you would run one minute and shut off, you, you would not restart for four more minutes. If you ran more than five minutes and the compressor shut off, you're going to go to the stop to start timer, which is three minutes. So you, you, you time out on the first one, shut off, you've got a three minute. The compressor manufacturer says we can start and stop these compressors every five minutes with no damage to them. So that's why your timers are a little bit low on these, but they say, hey, compressors can take care of that. Uh, one thing nice with a low end rush or no end rush, uh, you're not worried about a uh, high peak or hitting a demand on your building uh, uh, electrical uses. Interlock timer, we talked about that. That's the timer That's the timer that when my interlock contacts close, tell that I.O. card, compressor start, we have a 10 second delay on that. Full load gets into my lead lag and uh, when to bring on the second compressor. We're letting that down at a fairly low level to get the second compressor up and running a little quicker than normal, so we're doing. So I'd recommend leaving that there. 
So back to the view screen. Uh, again, we're back in all the data we read. Should the power go off, you'll always see this initial screen, which is pretty basic, just showing the, the percentage of amps. That's what we've got. So that's, that's kind of a quick overview of the panel. There's a few more things in there. Uh, a lot of these values that once they're set, you really won't have to touch. Uh, again, with your reset or your wire temperature, your building automation, you can do everything from that. You won't even have to touch a chiller for changing your water set point. One note on that though, you're going to see this active leaving water set point right here. And in our set screen, we have the water set point. Once you set the water set point, but your true active set point is going to read here. So depending on what milliamp signal he's going to send to this machine, you're going to see that value change. That's your active set point. So that's the one you want to look at to know what it's trying to control to, which would be the leaving out of the machine. The operator interface touchscreen, the OITS, the LCD panel is on a movable arm. You can move up and down. You can actually change the angle of your OITS as you're looking at it. Kind of a little easier, short guy, tall guy. What I'm showing here is the OITS screen in alarm condition. To bring that alarm condition up, all you do is touch the alarm key. At that point, you're going to see the alarm log. And the alarm log is going to show you the actual alarm. You can, on this one, when you're in a, um, not a critical alarm, you, that doesn't bring up the, the screen on the top. One way to reset the alarm, or the only way to reset the alarm, there's a clear key down here on the bottom. You hit that clear key, and what you're going to see is a series of pulses and numbers coming in down at the bottom. It'll take about 30, 40 seconds. You're going to watch your log clear. At that point, we're going to go to the close key and your, your alarm is clear. So we're counting down right now. You can see you just cleared your alarm. We go back to close key and you're going to see your main screen where the alarm is gone.